Hey, welcome in everybody to the Auburn Live Recruiting Show. I am Cole Pinkston, uh, Auburn Live Analyst, and we are without Jeffrey Lee once again. I think yeah. this is going to be the last time, though, Alan. I think this is Jeffrey is supposed to be getting back probably as you're listening to this podcast on Wednesday morning. He will be back in civilization. So <laughs> we'll we'll try to uh, you know we'll try to bring it home one more time without Jeffrey and uh, take your questions and to help me do that here is uh, Alan Head. How you doing, Alan? I'm doing fantastic, Cole. And for those that are worried about Jeffrey, I promise you, we actually just got a text that said, I will be back in civilization tomorrow. So That's those right. are, Cole was stealing those words verbatim from the group chat. But looking forward to go. talking about a uh, little football tonight, a little Auburn, and uh, seeing what the corner has to say. I'm very interested to see the questions. I, I like to, um, sometimes I like to go and look at them beforehand, Alan. Sometimes I like to just go in blind. <laughs> Uh, I could only guess what they're going to be about tonight because I don't know, man. Was this one of the most buzzing corner days we've had in a while? I think it was. I think so. I think so. And look, when you're talking five-star quarterbacks, four-star quarterbacks, rankings change, uh, just that summer activity, right? Like we, you're you're hitting that lull where we're we're preparing for the season, but we're not there just yet. And recruiting is what's on everybody's mind. And I think. Obviously, we uh, we crossed some territory today that that merited a, an uptick in discussion a little bit. Right, and do want to address that before we get into questions. Um, Julian Lewis. Now, Alan, you were first to this this morning. I think around eight thirty, or excuse me, Tuesday morning, eight thirty. Uh, I, I was. We had talked, checked around, and then I felt good enough about an hour later to jump in and say, "Look." Doesn't sound like it's trending the right way for Auburn right now. And how many times have we, you know, gone on this roller coaster? I think this time, though, the difference today is more so, is it over? It feels like it might be. What do you think? I think that's a fair way to look at it, it to put might in front of it. Because we don't know anything to be a fact just yet, right? Right. But it feels today, like today – Kind of last night when you and I were discussing this into today, it just feels like the window has closed a little bit there and that Auburn is potentially starting to trend in a different direction. I know that you've heard the name Deuce Knight or thought Deuce Knight would be somebody that would logically fit in what Hugh Freeze wants to do and maybe a pivot person. K.J. Lacey has long been a name that Auburn has been involved with and somebody that I think the staff is high on. And it seems like those quarterbacks, you were starting to hear a little bit more of that today and less about Juju. And obviously, Steve Wiltfong had his own update where he felt like Colorado was very heavily in the mix and that USC was still a player somewhat, uh, but that Auburn may be trending elsewhere. So I think what you and I heard um, in combination with obviously Steve Wiltfong, who I have the utmost respect for, probably has moved us off that bubble a little bit. But again, this is how we feel today. Who knows, man? I mean, this this roller coaster has been going five different directions since probably March, uh, and yeah. it, I would anticipate another term before it's all said and done. It's just kind of how it's been with this this excuse me this recruitment. I agree, and and it, it may not be over. And the reason we point towards it possibly being over is because we I think we've all heard uh, you and I, Alan and Jeffrey included, that we didn't think Auburn was going to drag this out forever, and right. The reason is because this is heavily – this recruitment is heavily dependent on NIL. I have no problem saying that. I feel confident in saying that. It is what it is at this point. This is the age we're in. Shouldn't be shy about saying stuff like that. That's the bottom line with this recruitment. And if there was a number on the table by one of the four schools that you know about, USC, Colorado, Indiana, Auburn, we wouldn't be playing this game anymore. It'd be over. And for whatever reason, that number there hasn't been a number that's just made them that camp, the the Lewis camp, want to stop and and make a final decision. And I think Auburn's they they just don't want to play that game. Whether it's the right move or not, I, I'm sure it'll be discussed ad nauseum by every fan for Auburn. But as we talked about before, the margin of error is small. If you're Hugh Freeze, you have to make decisions sometimes that may be good or bad, but you got to make a call at some point. 
and we think Auburn's getting close if they haven't already to making a call on this one and going, we need to, we need to either, you know, do something or, or move on. So that's where I think, we think it's getting to right now, right? Yeah, I think that is the fairest way to put it, Cole, is that it is decision time. And whether it's Juju, whether it's one of the other two quarterbacks that we've discussed here on this panel, I think that there just needs to be some finality there. And, and that's the way maybe the staff feels. And maybe that's the way Juju's camp feels. I don't honestly yeah. know. But as of today, it, it certainly doesn't feel like it's trending in the right direction. And what you and I aren't going to do is from this panel and say, you know, that Juju wasn't wanted by this staff or that he's not a good player. Those things would be completely false and would be disingenuous on our part to say those things. I think he's a very good player. Um, even though he was dropped in the rankings by Charles Power, I, I think it's a situation where it's just a byproduct of other guys that are maybe physically bring a different dimension to the game. Juju's not the biggest quarterback ever, but he's in stre- extremely accurate. Uh, the anticipatory part of the game is where he excels. And I think he is connected on the camp scene and with other recruits. So there is that attractive part of him. But we just mentioned two other quarterbacks in Deuce Stein and K.J. Lacey that also have connections on the camp circuit, right? And also in their own right would be a really good fit in a Hugh Freeze offense and an RPO, vertical shot, downhill running game type offense. And I, I just firmly believe that, you know, Regardless of who you settle on, if it's one of those three, Auburn's going to come out of this looking really, really good. Yeah, I agree. I like all three of those quarterbacks. I like KJ Lacey a lot. I like, I think Deuce Knight has a lot of talent, and I think it could translate to an offense like Hugh Freeze's. Um, I think Juju Lewis is really good. I would never take that away from him. I think he's a good, a good quarterback. I think he's got a chance to be really successful on the next level. I think what hurts the most if you're an Auburn fan, if you're maybe this Auburn. Uh, Steph, if you were to not land Julian Lewis, I, I think you were looking at it. One of the biggest things was what it would do for the class, right? Yep. Because he reached five star status. Even if he's not with on three right now, there's going to be some other rankings changes. Whether he fluctuates or not, he's reached five star status. He's a quarterback. Those guys attract players. Yes. Bottom line. And that's that's the hit you're taking if you don't get Julian Lewis. And I think everybody understands that. Uh, but that's uh, – we'll probably get a question about it. We'll probably get a question about one of the three quarterbacks. It's been talked about. It's been a hot topic um, all day and probably will be again on Wednesday and Thursday and as the week goes. But let's get into the questions from the corner and mm-hmm. what everybody wants us to talk about tonight. I question like number it. one, War Eagle Insider. How much of a factor is Alvin Henderson with Deuce Knight? I know a year ago – they were very vocal about wanting to play with each other. You know, um, I had forgotten about that War Eagle Insider, but you're right. There, there was a connection there between Alvin Henderson and Deuce Knight. You know, I've talked to Deuce Knight several times, and he's always been high on Auburn. It, it's not new. There's nothing new there with interest in Auburn. I think he's always had uh, a special place for Auburn. Um, I just don't know at this point – what that's going going to mean. Is it going to translate to Auburn just being able to get right back into the picture? I don't know. Uh, but having Alvin Henderson in your class, and we talked about this too, Alvin Henderson is a guy that's pretty popular with recruits. Yes. It, it, a lot of people were turned off by him committing to Penn State and sort of playing a game with the recruiting thing and then flipping back to Auburn. Sure, but he's still one of those guys that, Everybody knows he's popular. He's a highly ranked recruit. He has been for a long time. One of the most recruited players in the country is Alvin Henderson. Believe it or not. No, I I agree. I mean, you're talking about a kid that's been a household name probably going on for three years now, Cole. I mean, I, I think you and I first started discussing Alvin Henderson fall of 22. I think that's kind of when he popped yeah. on the scene a little bit. And you're talking about a kid that's been featured on the camp circuit, discussed, talked about, and somebody that knows a lot of other players, right? He's been on a lot of different campuses. He's been to yeah. a lot of different camps. He's a kid that's been productive. Um, and he's very active on social media. And you're right, Cole, in that he's very popular with other recruits. So while I don't know the ins and outs of his and Deuce's relationship, 
Uh, it was one where they were, you know, very public on social media about a year or so ago. And we'll see what it's like uh, if Alvin gets involved and tries to re-recruit uh, Deuce a little bit to come join this class. So that's going to be an interesting dynamic for sure. I do want to throw this in there before we move on to the next question. Um, it, the question is asked a lot. You know, did we wait? Did, did Auburn waste too much time on on Julian Lewis? Is it too late to pivot to another quarterback? It's a fair question. But I will – I want to share this K.J. Lacey quote, and this is the last time I talked to K.J. Lacey in Nashville um, in May. It was May 31st. Talked to him. He was very – you know, I'm committed to Texas, but I still hear from Auburn a lot, and they they want me. They make me a, a number one priority. And that was even during the, the highest of Julian Lewis news to Auburn, you know, chatter. That, that was during that. So they never stopped recruiting him one. Um, this is what he said, you know, I asked him, why is Auburn still in it for you? Why are you still considering Auburn? He said, it's the relationships I have with the coaches, the star power around their receivers, the O-line is good, and there's a lot of good things going on there. So at the end of the day, when you get down to the nitty-gritty, close to the end of this recruiting cycle, quarterbacks are going to look at it and go, there's some good things going there. Uh, it wouldn't be a bad situation to step into at all, and it's going to keep getting better with the way they're recruiting, right? Absolutely. And then I think if you're a quarterback, you want to get on the field sooner rather than later. Not many quarterbacks in today's age want to come into a place where they're going to have to sit for three years. That's just typically not ideal for them. Auburn, the quarterback situation is going to be wide open, right? Peyton Thorne, good, bad, or indifferent, is graduating after this year, so the incumbent starter is going to be gone. And so your avenue to playing time is very clear. And that's appealing to a lot of high caliber quarterbacks. And I think that, you know, there are three programs in the SEC right now that don't have quarterback commits in their class. And that is Auburn, Ole Miss and Florida, Florida. The situation just kind of is what it is. Billy Napier is fighting a lot of negative recruiting, fighting a lot of hot seat talk. And so that's not ideal for him, but it is interesting that two offensive play callers, uh, and, and guys that are very highly regarded on the offensive side of the ball and Hugh Freeze and Lane Kiffin don't have a quarterback in their class just yet. So maybe maybe that, that will be an interesting battle coming down the stretch for, you know, along with Steve Sarkeesian, because this is the other part about it. Say Juju does flip from SC and goes to Colorado. That's going to create a domino effect to a degree. And so who's going to become available we know we live in the day and age of NIL where sometimes kids become interested because a number becomes available that wasn't there initially. Think no longer. I mean, just think to the last signing period where, you know, the number one quarterback in the country, uh, the Raiola kid, is committed to Georgia. Two weeks out from signing day, he flips to Nebraska. What's been alleged is an NIL deal that was too good for him to pass up, along with the fact that his dad and his uncle were alumni there at Nebraska. Uh, and I think Georgia ended up flipping a quarterback late from somebody else, but that's one of the situations that happens, right? Like, it, and I, I think for anybody to pretend to be ignorant to the fact that that that, that couldn't happen at Auburn would not necessarily be paying attention to the way trends are in today's game. So there's a lot there too. I mean, a lot to be attractive about Auburn uh, when you talk about the the caliber of the wide receiver core that you have that you be playing with, in addition to like you mentioned the way they're recruiting in this class the opportunity to play quarterback, the NIL opportunities at Auburn, the brand that Auburn is, a lot of positives. And I feel like they're going to walk away with a high caliber signal caller either which way it turns. Definitely. Question number two, Knight Rider. What are the top four most realistic gets at wide receiver for the high school signing class? Ooh, four. That's a good one. Gosh, four. I don't know if I can come up with – yeah, well, let's see. I, I would put Caleb Cunningham in there. I understand that there's a lot of chatter with Alabama, but I, I still would put Caleb Cunningham in there. Cunningham in there right now, as realistic, yeah. Because look, Marcus has worked extremely hard and has a relationship there, right? Hugh Freeze yeah. has a relationship there, and we know how they prioritized him. And while I, at this point, if I were picking, I'd say he's going to commit to Alabama. Sure. But Auburn, that's a realistic option for Auburn. They're in there with this kid. It's not like they're just 
so far out of the mix for him that there's no opportunity for him to get him. Things things change in recruiting quite often. Yeah. So I, I would say Caleb Cunningham. I'd say Der- Derek Smith, who's committed to Alabama. Yes. I think he's definitely in there. Um, I, I'd even go TK Norman, who's who is uh, committed to Texas A&M. I wouldn't completely write him off. I think Auburn likes him enough to continue to recruit him. He's not a tier one guy, I don't think. But at some point, you know, wh- wh- where's this receiver class going to go? Right now, it's very uncertain. So, is, is he a guy that you end up circling back to? Maybe. Is, I don't disagree. One more, who would one more be, Alan? I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you two names. Uh, Sam Turner is one. Yep. Because I, I do think that he's going to be a kid that's local. He's in Atlanta. He was a recent offer by Marcus Davis, which means they saw something with the young man. He's talked about wanting to get on campus and visit Auburn. Maybe he's a kid that shows up for Big Cat. or Maybe they wait to see how he progresses during his senior year and try to bring him in for an OV during the season. But that's one I'm going to monitor. And then I'm going to give you another name of a kid that hasn't decided just yet. He hasn't visited Auburn, but I think he might in the fall, and that's Malik Clark out of South Carolina. Yep. I think – that is a realistic target for Auburn. He's, I, I believe he had Auburn in his top five, and right now most people would project him to North Carolina. And maybe that holds to be true, but I think given how Auburn's passing game could develop this year, Auburn could become very attractive for a young man that's a big-bodied wide receiver, uh, a vertical threat that's very similar to some of the other receivers that we have in this offense and could be featured very well in one-on-one. So – that's the name that I'm going to continue to pay attention to is Malik Clark. Yeah, I, I sort of paid attention to him as well. I think he's definitely worth watching. Um, question three, A. Hill. Who do you guys like more as a prospect between K.J. Lacey and Deuce Knight? Ooh. Do you guys think they are a huge drop-off from Julian Lewis? Well, uh, we were talking before this, Alan, and I, I've watched I, – I like highlight tapes. I like camps. But I like game film. Yeah. Game film is where you learn about a guy. How does he handle pressure? How does he handle just the small little nuances within a play? How does he handle, you know, it's far down as to how does he handle each snap? I mean, those are things that are important when you're either trying to rank or evaluate a quarterback. And when I watched the three of them, I thought it was closer than I originally thought. Uh, I still would put Julian Lewis. I think he has the most tools of mm-hmm. any of the three. As far as tools, things to work with, I like him at number one. Uh, number two, because I love his operation. I love his poise at times, and I like his innovation, the way that he can create plays outside of the pocket and do things of, of that nature. KJ Lacey. Deuce Knight might have the highest talent ceiling of them all yeah. as a runner and a passer. But I don't like his operation as much as I like KJ Lacey's. So I would have Lacey right behind Lewis. A small gap between the two because of the tools Lewis has. But I like Lacey, and then Knight's pretty close behind Lacey. But they're, those two are close, but I give Lacey the edge. No, I, I don't disagree with any of that, Cole. I think we, when we discussed this before the show, my opinion of Deuce Knight is he is the most physically gifted quarterback of the three. Like, I think if, if, you were to measure upside, he has the most upside, but he also has the longest way to go, in my honest opinion. There's some technical things that Deuce is going to have to clean up to be able to be a successful quarterback in the SEC, but all the physical tools are there. Um, yeah. It's just refining some of the technique, you know, shortening his base some, uh, some changing his throwing motion a little bit. There's some things, some really good things he does from an athletic standpoint that you just can't coach. But I think there's some other things as far as learning to play the position of quarterback that he'll need to continue to refine. I'm with you on KJ. I just I believe that kid's a winner. Um, I said it before in our pre-show. I mean, he just there's so many different parts of his game that remind me of Stetson Bennett. You know, a, a guy that all he did at Georgia was win, get himself drafted in the fourth round of the NFL draft, and you know is going on to make the, the Los Angeles Rams. So. You know, that's realistically – I know some people would probably chuckle at that comparison, but I think Stetson Bennett was a hell of a college quarterback and that uh, comparing K.J. Lacey to him is you – know, I'm doing that young man a service by saying that. And then 
obviously Julian Lewis, I, he would be number one on my board as well as far as ready, polished quarterback. I do think there are some things where he looks a little overcoached at times. But as far as, again, the anticipatory part, the accuracy part, all of it's there. But I believe all three of those quarterbacks can be successful. And I think all three of them could be successful in Auburn's operation. So, yeah. again, if you know, you're know you splicing hairs between the three, and I don't think the drop-off is immense with one to the next. I, I just – I don't. People might roll their eyes with Stetson Bennett, but – I'd argue with you. I, I would argue with you if you thought that Stetson Bennett was not a good quarterback. Is not still a good quarterback. The I NFL would Bennett. argue with you, right? No, dude. Talk about a gamer. At some point, you have to, even with the tools, like a guy like Julian Lewis has the tools. Right. That's not in question with him. He's a gamer, too. He does both really well. KJ Lacey is for sure a gamer. When the lights come on, he's making plays. Bottom line, yes. yep. And he knows how to innovate. He knows how to how to get out of a bind. He knows how to do all that stuff. I mean, if if you're looking for, he's not really. If you're looking for a Hugh Freeze comparison, I like Chad Kelly. Okay, that's, I like that's, that. That's, that's the kind of guy we're looking at here. Just just a gamer. I think he's not polished. I think there's some things that need to be fixed a little bit with with uh you know mechanics and things of that nature but when the lights come on these guys are making plays you, you, chad kelly stats a minute that's the category right they're just winners right they just win and compete at everything that they do and that's what i see with kj lacy he is just regardless of physical limitation okay because he's not the biggest kid he's five ten and a half five eleven you know probably 180 pounds soaking wet right now Sure. But the kid just goes out there and plays, gives it everything he's got. And more often than not, he comes out with a W at the very end. And so you're right. And at, I think the innovation part to me is probably the most attractive part of his game. He doesn't get I agree. flustered and he has the ability to make throws off platform and to, to move in the pocket. And he just has an awareness about him, you know, right. it, it it, it, some kids just have it, and it's hard to quantify at times, but it's it, right? And I think KJ is one of those kind of guys that has it. Sure. And I, on the other side of that coin, I will say being a gamer sometimes can be bad for you in games. Yeah. It, you, 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 you can be too confident. You can put it in the wrong place. You can, you can throw interceptions. You can do all this. I mean, Bo Nix at Auburn had a little bit of that going on. He was a gamer. <laughs> He's a guy that struggled sometimes to be, you know, uh, polished and stay in the pocket and things of that nature. But I would argue Auburn now has a better setup on offense than it did at that time, especially on the offensive line. I think your skill players are going to be better too eventually. I think that's where they're headed. You get a quarterback in there that can do things like KJ Lacey or any of the three, I, I, I think you got a nice operation going on there. Agreed. Question four, Danny Pitts. Danny Pitts had a, ha, has had a good week on the corner. I agree. Which recruit or recruits do you all foresee Auburn gaining the most ground with during this dead period before Big Cat weekend? Any surprises? I'm guessing maybe surprises to show up at Big Cat weekend or maybe somebody to resurface or come up on the board? Um, What do you think, Alan? I so, I probably the young man out of Thompson. That's Jared Smith is probably the one that you're going to make the biggest move with, in my opinion. Um, he's a guy that they've liked for a while. Got an opportunity to work him out, see him in person. I think it only made that interest grow. And so that's someone that I went from thinking might end up in the class to thinking we've got a, he's got a very good shot of ending up in the class. And I think he's got an even better shot of ending up at Big Cat Weekend much more so than I initially anticipated. I think he's I think he is um one of the guys I'm most confident will be at Big Cat weekend right now. Jared Smith, uh, I think he's going to take his official visit to Auburn during the fall, one of the few that waited until football season to take all of his OVs. Of course, you're unlimited, but you can't take one, you can't take more than one to one school. Right? So you you can hold some over until fall football season and jared smith did that with auburn he's going to take his then i like the way that one's lining up if 
to stay with what our topic's been, though, if somebody that Auburn might be making a move with might end up at Big Cat Weekend, I'd say there's probably going to be a push for K.J. Lacey now, <laughs> wouldn't you? Either K.J. Lacey or Deuce, right? Like I yeah. think they're going to push for one of those two to be at Big Cat Weekend. And I think Auburn wants to get this quarterback situation squared away sooner rather than later. I don't think they want to carry this into the fall because they want to continue to build a class. So you're right. The expectation would be that hopefully a signal call would be there in addition to Jared Smith. Definitely. Question five, Brian's biceps. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> you can say what you want about him. He he did have some biceps. Uh, yeah, he could, he, he could bench press, man. Yeah, no doubt. Any other known potential QB targets if we whiff on KJ and Deuce? Known? No. I had a yeah. – yeah. I had a post probably a couple weeks ago now on guys that I thought were on the periphery, and I still think they were evaluated, but I don't know that I would necessarily – say they're true targets right now. I think given my intel that there's confidence on this staff that they can land either one of Juju Lewis, Deuce Knight, and or KJ Lacey, that they feel confident that they're going to be able to get one of those three. If I'm leaning in any direction, it is KJ right now. I think Auburn's odds are probably the best with him. Uh, But the young man's name that got a lot of intrigue in that post that I put up is Jerron Cueve Sangapuateli. I think is how you say his name. Oh, my goodness. Uh, recent commitment to Cal. And so he's probably somebody I'm going to continue to keep my eye on, but I, I just don't expect him to be involved at this point. See, yeah. Cole, the, look, you're going to remember the time that Alan Head got, you know, a, a Pacific Islander name correct on the that- podcast. Jeffrey missed that, right? That was incredible, really. <laughs> Although I would have paid money to hear Jeffrey attempt. It. Oh, look, man, I would have paid good money for, for Jeffrey with it. Put a chaw in to hear that name. We we may have to just we may have to just stop everything. And give and do it on the Colin show this Sunday. There you as go. Zach in the back has suggested. Question number six: BBAU ten. What is the latest on Hezekiah Harris and his potential timeline for a decision? Also, how hard do you guys think we'll pursue T.K. Norman? Interesting. We talked about T.K. Norman a little earlier. Hezekiah Harris is a guy that, boy, I, I've been on alert with. Uh, when I say alert, what I mean is there are guys that like to have a date and want to have a big moment, I guess you would say. Mm-hmm. And not to say the guys that don't set a date don't want a big moment. Some of them like the, the surprise element. I, I think Hezekiah Harris might be one of those guys. I don't I don't foresee him going, all right, this is the date. Here's my announcement for my announcement, and here's my announcement. I don't think he's that guy. I think he's just going to do it at some point. And I'm still leaning Auburn pretty heavily. I've got a pick in for Auburn. I think Jeffrey does too. Had it for a little while. Talked to a couple sources on him, and yeah. Looks good there. Maybe Big Cat. Maybe that's the guy that does it there. He's definitely going to be there. I don't think Hezekiah Harris has missed an Auburn event. When I say that, I mean like Big Cat, Junior Day, all those big days. And he's had a lot of games too. He was at A Day. <laughs> so I feel pretty good about that one. LSU, Clemson, those are his other two. LSU pushed pretty good. But I, I like Auburn for Hezekiah Harris. And Looking at potentially Big Cat for that. I don't think he drags it too much longer. And then TK Norman, what's what's your feel on TK Norman right now? My feel on TK is they're going to evaluate him in season. I don't think they're prepared to make a push just yet. I do think that Texas A&M is an excellent fit for what he wants. I mean, for the kind of receiver that he is. And it feels like Auburn's looking for more outside wide receivers in this class, not so much – the slot position. I think they feel like they've got a couple of guys that they feel good about there, but he's a kid I'm very high on. I know he's a kid that you're high on. He's got a lot of playmaking ability. And so if he has a big fall or has a big start to his senior year, it would not be outside the realm of possibility for Auburn to get significantly more interested, specifically if we haven't maybe gotten a good feel from some of the other targets that we have on the board. Yeah, tier tier two probably. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
So you might have to miss on a few guys in tier one to get to him. But I do think Auburn wants one slot in this class. I think they would take one slot. And he's he's a good fit for the slot. I think he can play both, but slot would be good for him on the next level. Not a huge guy. You know, he's going to have to add some weight when he gets to the next level, but a lot of speed on him. Uh, I do think he's a good player. Again, we've talked about this a hundred times, but we haven't had senior year yet. Senior year is where you really, really find out about a guy. Where have they progressed? How 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 are they going to look when they get into college? You get a good glimpse of it senior year. Yep. Look no further than last year, right? There's a young man out of Thompson that earned his offer with the way that oh, he played yeah. his senior year. Caleb so, Harris. right, Caleb Harris, who I think was trending to Kentucky this time last year. Uh, maybe it was, you know, maybe it was Tennessee. It, it was, it was a different school than Auburn. It was there were other SEC schools involved, and then Auburn turned up the heat late and was able to get him in the class. And I think he may end up being one of their better playmakers, specifically on the defensive side of the ball in that class. I mean, I think they found a real gem. Yep. TK Norman may find himself in a very similar situation where Auburn decides to dial it up if he goes out there and, and you know, plays up to his capability or up to his ceiling, because I, I'm with you. I, I think he's got a lot of tools, good speed, and a, and a guy that can create separation in the slot. Probably helps for, for TK Norman that Auburn has offered his teammate, who's a 2026 receiver, Zion Crumpton. And that's the guy I know Auburn's going to like a lot going into the 2026 class. You know, do they try to start a little pipeline there at Carver? Wouldn't be a bad place to do it. So, Interesting there. Um, question number seven, Trooper Taylor's towel. We've already touched on this a little bit, but what's new with Jared Smith? Jared Smith, four-star edge, mostly edge for Auburn, probably could grow into a five-technique defensive lineman like a Keldrick Falk. That's really a, a good comparison on how he's built. Um, but Auburn likes him at edge right now. He's probably mm -hmm. at the top of the edge board. If not number one, he's – Number two, probably, right? I would and think so. It seems like the biggest competition for him right now, and that could change, is Ole Miss and South Carolina. I haven't heard anything different. Have you? No, I think it's Ole Miss, South Carolina. I believe that Chad Simmons and or uh, Steve Wilfong had an update on Jared Smith not too long ago, and Auburn – South Carolina, Ole Miss seem to be the schools that were mentioned. Georgia, probably on the periphery a little bit, somebody that's continuing to evaluate Jerry Smith. But I think Auburn's going to continue to make a move with the in-state prospect. He's a guy that we've talked about it. They see him being able to play at both positions on the edge where he could play some of the end, he could play some of the buck. He's not pigeonholed into one spot right now, even though I think they favor him more to the buck at this point. Yeah, As his body develops, right, there was a time where – you know, Keldrick Falk was favored at the buck, and then he grew into an end. And so I, I see Jared Smith very similar where he could start out on one side and potentially as his body continues to grow and develop. I mean, you're talking about a kid with a size 18 shoe. He's probably going to get relatively large, right? I mean, I just don't anticipate yeah. him being any less than 265 when it's all said and done. No, and he's, he's not as filled out as Keldrick Falk was at this point in his career, but his frame is similar. Yes. They, they're just big. Just, just big people <laughs> at the end of the day, and, and got a lot of length and all that. They, they're just built to play on the edge, whether with a hand on the ground or as a stand-up guy. Agreed. And they both, they both have similar athleticism. I think Jared Smith has a lot. He showed me a lot at the Under Armour camp, and uh, I, I'm very, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how he plays this season too. Jared Smith at Thompson, he doesn't get much better than that. So, no, that'll be interesting. All right, question number eight, Tigers Unlimited. What will be our biggest position of need for the 26 class? Hmm. Who? Interesting. That's a good question. Um, it's hard to call it at this point these days because you got Portal coming up. You don't know what mm -hmm. that's going to bring. You don't know how many people are going to leave, one. Two, you don't know what they're going to bring in. And I, I would, even with all that, I think defensive line. Is going to be interior. Well, both I, interior and buck. I'm with you, Cole. I, I think you're losing playmakers in those classes uh, at those levels because you're going to lose Philip Bleedy this year. You're going to lose 
Jason this year. You're going to lose uh, the young man that came in from AM. I'm trying to think of his name right now. Rakes. Yeah, Isaiah Rakes. So you're losing those three this year. Gage Keys, maybe you lose this year. I think he's got an opportunity for an additional year, if I remember correctly. He does. He does. So you could Trill get Carter. some. Trill Carter is another guy that you're losing this year. So obviously that's creating a need in this class. And then you look to the next year, Keldrick Falk. I mean, we didn't talk about this, but Keldrick Falk is representing Auburn at SEC Media Days, right? That's crazy, isn't it? I mean, it's it, it's good. It, it, yeah, it's great because it me it, to me it makes me think a from a maturity standpoint he's carrying himself off the field like you would expect a player of his caliber to do, and two on the field because typically they don't take guys to these things they think are going to be slouches on the field, right? Typically, yeah. you're taking it, especially a young guy. You're taking a contributor, which makes me think they believe that he's going to fit the billing of what he was pegged as when he was a five-star recruit coming out of high school. So, if he plays up to that ceiling this year, and next he's going to be gone to the NFL draft. And if that's the case, you're absolutely going to be looking for some more defensive linemen because you just have to continue to stock that each and every year if you're going to be competitive in the SEC. Yeah, now, that was a big deal that he got chosen. It was shocking. I did not expect that. Wouldn't have guessed it, um, but definitely, you know, props to him. And he's a personality guy, too. He's a guy that you, you know, his personality sort of lights up a room. He's got a lot of kind of like Jeremiah Wright. Those, both right. of those guys are like that. So he, he'll be good. He'll he'll have some – he'll probably have some good one-liners or something up there. On no, the I believe it. And the direct quote I got from a source kind of outside the Auburn sphere when he saw that come across was, Damn, that wasn't on my bingo card. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I like yep. it. All right, question number nine, Romano. Does the money not spent on Julian Lewis open the door to going into someone else's recruitment? And if so, who would that be? Um, I'm thinking transfer portal. Yeah, you could open the door to that. It could also open the door to maybe somebody like Derek Smith, where you decide that you want to provide a little bit more of an incentive for that young man to join your class. So I can see it creating some uh, some monetary incentive for other guys if you're able to spread that money around, contingent on you know what other resources you're going to have to utilize to get a quarterback. Quarterback guys, quarterback recruitments are different. You don't. I don't think anybody knows what the price tag will be just yet. If it's not Juju Lewis, um, what it's going to take to potentially get somebody else into your class. So before we kind of say, hey, it could help you here, it could help you there, we probably need to know, okay, what's the you know what's the resource cost for, for getting somebody else first? But Derek Smith, somebody I could definitely absolutely see. Um, Duke Johnson, I think you could probably capitalize there and provide a little bit more NIL incentive for them to join your for him to join your class. Maybe some of those targets on the defensive line, like a Walter Mathis or something of that nature, where you really kind of have a need, you can you could take some of that money that you might have been allocating towards Juju and put it towards those positions, the positions that we really need in this class. Maybe offensive line, right? That's sure. a big one for this class. You've got two really big targets, one of which I don't think is motivated by NIL at all. I don't think Andrew Babalola cares one bit about NIL. I mean – and I think that's something you and I have discussed over text, so I'm not saying anything that's a new thought here, but sure. that young man, and credit to his parents, is just wired differently, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very different in today's world. Um, that's that's what it sounds like to us from following that recruitment. It doesn't sound like he's that big on NIL at all. No. And, you know, good for him. Some people are. It, it's out there. You got the opportunity for it. I don't knock anybody for that. Um, no. and, and the reason we say, or at least that I say quarterback recruitments are so wild and because they're pretty smart guys, usually they're savvy and, and they, even the best NIL offers, not necessarily the, the reason a guy would, a quarterback would, you know, commit to a school. They know that their value goes up when the team around them is really good. Yes. And they can make more money that way. Okay. You offer me this. Well, my value is way higher than that because I could go to, you know, Ohio State and they got everybody that's going to help me get to the next level. So it, you just don't know. You have to really find that key pitch. What is the key pitch that quarterback's looking for with, you know, with Julian Lewis? We think it's NIL. 
that's that's where we think it was. We think it is. With all, it's not just that easy with all of them. I, I don't know. We got to learn about KJ Lacey, Deuce Knight. We got to figure all that out. But Absolutely. it's hard. It's hard to figure out where they're leaning. Could be different day to day. That's how that goes. Uh, question ten, Robert Dale one. What is the intel that initiated the drop in confidence regarding Antonio Coleman? Hmm. This would be a good Jeffrey question if we had yeah. Jeffrey on here. Because he did, I think he did drop him some, a few percentage points on the hot board, right? I believe he dropped him down to about 20%. Hmm. You know, I, I'm not as privy to that as Jeffrey is. I've heard lately that didn't feel like Auburn was making the move we once thought it was. Mm-hmm. I don't know the why so much. So I can't really put too much into that. You know, at some point, Auburn's going to make moves for, for some defensive linemen. They got two in the class. When it comes down to it, how important is it to keep those two in the class? I mean, do, do, are you really trying hard to get – two or three more guys, or are you trying really hard to keep the guys you have and then add one, maybe two more? What's the more important thing there? I, I think keeping the guys you got because the two you got are – I think, to be yeah, the two you got are two of the best defensive linemen in your state and two of the best defensive linemen in the entire Southeast. And I think there are some really good players in the Southeast, but they're easily top ten on the defensive line board, in my opinion. If you're talking, I mean, littered throughout the entire Southeast, both of those guys, in my opinion, on your top 10 list. And so retention is huge on that front. And then can you go get another guy that's got a lot of potential, like a Walter Mathis? Um, We've mentioned some other guys. I think there's a young man in South Florida who's originally from Canada. Got some ties to the state of Alabama. I think he played – Zach, jump in here if you can. But I think he played at Faith Academy, and I'm trying to remember the young man's name. Floyd yeah. Ricard, yeah, he is somebody now. I, I I don't know though. I haven't heard too much about him. It's it's one of those deals where a lot of schools were high on him at one point. Have they dropped off a little bit the the buzz that was growing around him? Do you think, or is it still pretty high? So it sounds like USC is extremely high on Floyd Bucard, and that's where he's predicted to land as of today. I think Miami holds him in very high regard, and those are probably the two teams Auburn would have to contend with to land the young man, uh, which I would not put the odds in Auburn's favor as of today. But that's one of those, let's see how the season goes, right? What if Miami doesn't have the year that they're kind of projected to have right now? What if USC has a very rough first start to their Big Ten season? So, and then Auburn goes out and, you know, they're eight and four, nine and three. Well, maybe Auburn becomes that much more appealing, especially if some of the interior defensive linemen that are, you know, preparing themselves for the next level really have a big senior year. So I think there's some things there within that recruitment where it has an opportunity to change and shift somewhat. And then also uh, the other name to pay attention to is Xavion Hardy. That's a guy that could play inside, could play outside. So he's a name I'm going to continue to kind of watch and monitor. And a kid that's very talented, right? I mean, I think out of Macon, Georgia, originally, correct? Yeah, yeah. I think he was a four-star, at least by one service, maybe more than one. But I think he had a four-star rating as a high school prospect. Four-star rating, signed with South Carolina out of high high school, was placed by them in junior college. But it seems like he's open. He's not just listening to South Carolina. He's he's open to a series of teams. And so we'll kind of see where that goes. And I would tell you this as far as proximity to home goes, making Georgia to Auburn is a heck of a lot closer than making Georgia to Columbia, South Carolina. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty close. And the reason I brought up, you know, keeping the two guys you got – Malik Autry, Jordan Crawford. If that's the case, and you you value that higher than getting a guy like Antonio Coleman, maybe nil wise, you you go all right. Antonio Coleman's going to cost us a lot, and we need to focus on keeping these two guys in there, right? So, if that's the case, maybe you start looking at the Floyd Bucards, Xavier Hardy's a lot harder, Walter Mathis. I don't think you'd have a huge draw. I like those guys. I think those guys are all pretty good. And you add them to Malik Autry and Jordan Crawford. May not be a terrible strategy. 
Um, but anyway, guys, that'll do it. That's 10 questions. I thought that we definitely answered them, answered them thoroughly as <laughs> you and I tend to do Alan. Yep. Uh, any, how about you tonight? Yeah, I got a, uh, I got a couple. Let me pull mine back up. You go ahead, Cole, and then I'll, okay. I'll close this out here. I have several, um, I, I'm, all right, let me start at the top here. I got a little list, MRJ06, and I'm going to have to write these down. MRJ06, because he had me laughing today, talking about how the you know the meltdown started, of course, this morning early. He said, you know, sometimes I think the internet was a mistake. <laughs> had me laughing, talking about all the Twitter things going on and all that good stuff. Yes, yes. Um, also Taylor made two Taylor made two man. If you remember Taylor made has been with us for a long time. I think he since has, the beginning. he I has think since the beginning during the Harson days. Taylor made was not a happy camper. He was not a guy that you, you wanted to see posting that much. He was somewhat of an Eeyore, a Debbie downer. Sure. And and rightfully so, you know, right, good look, look, looking back at it. Well, now he's one of my favorite posters. He's had a complete turnaround. He's a changed man. And uh, I think Hugh Freeze has done it for him. So I'm I'm a I'm a big fan of Taylor Made right now. I like the, I like his content. I like his posts. Um TJ Molt. Oh yes, that's a good one. TJ Molt. Let's see, what did he do that I like so Oh yeah, he just he's he's one of my guys. I I always look for voices of reason. That's that's who gets my how about you's more times than not. I thought TJ Molt had some good comments during the whole, you know, on three rankings debacle that we had on the corner. So TJ <laughs> Molt gets one. <laughs> Eagle five. Yes, Eagle great five. poster. He's a great poster. I know he's been around for a long time. He had a long post about Caleb Harris way off, you know, a while back saying that this guy was going to be good. I think it was even before spring camp or spring. Yeah, spring that he said this. So give him props on that. He liked what he saw from Caleb Harris on the field, and he obviously uh, knew what he was talking about. And I appreciate that. T-Dubham. T-Dub-B-Ham. Excuse me. T-Dub-B-Ham has just had me laughing all week. So he gets one. The real Stanzi. Ah, he said make that times two. That was one of mine. Okay. The real Stanzi, congrats. Congrats, brother. Uh, he just had, I don't know if it's fir- if it's his first. I think it is his first kid. Anyway, he did. He just, he just had his kid, Conway, I believe is the name. That's correct. Back, so congrats to you, real Stanzi. And then I'm going to give one to Alan Head. Oh. Yep. Alan Head gets mine as well because – you have been a, a good partner these past four shows. And, man, the pronunciation on that Hawaiian quarterback. Hey, you know, some some days, as my grandfather used to say, even a blind hog finds an acorn. So, <laughs> you know, it, it can happen. But, uh, yeah. no, double up on the real Stanzi. That was awesome. Anytime that somebody's willing to share bringing a, uh, a kid into the world, man, that's awesome for you and your family. BBP gets one for me. Uh, per the usual, and then Stephen Queef gets <laughs> one for me. Oh, uh, man. For his post of maybe the 10K subscriber celebration, we can set up a steel cage match at Charles Power versus at Rice 105. <laughs> Winner gets the final, the final re rank of the 2024 class. Oh, my goodness. Um, that goodness. literally, I fell out of my chair at the dinner table reading that one. So, Stephen Queef, you absolutely earned that. How about you, brother? <laughs> and listen, uh, I understand the board was not happy with Charles Power and the rankings. If you're somebody who does rankings like Charles, this is nothing new for you. No. That's part of your your world, people hating you for rankings. All right. It's, it's just how it's going to be. There's no way around it. No. no way around it. It's a tough job, and uh, I commend him for doing it because it's tough. There's a lot of kids out there. There's a lot of film to watch, 
and you're doing the best you can to make the bets on the right kids. And it's tough, man. I could not agree with you more, Cole. It, it is not an envious position at all, man. Um, Cause you're never going to make any, they're just teams that are consistently going to be unhappy with the way you rank their player. Right. But I right. think at the end of the day, for the integrity of his process, he needs to do it the way he sees fit. There are other Rudy recruiting services that rank guys that, uh, you know, are on our commitment list a little bit differently. And so everybody has their own process, but I think Charles does a pretty good job. I, I really do. I think it is, I think it's a very difficult job. Um, but, uh, one I certainly wouldn't want to have. That's for certain. No question. And having said all that, getting to see him learn about rice was was an interesting thing. And uh, what, all of the corner members are all going, all right, Charles. Now you know we we've all been in one of these with rice, so we. <laughs> <laughs> so that's uh, you know that that's how that went. But anyway, good show, guys. Um, you know, we, we will be back Sunday night for the Colin show. Jeffrey's back. He is yes. back. He will be back. He will take over hosting duties. Thank goodness. I'm okay with that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, hopefully we, we had some good shows for you here while Jeffrey was gone. I think, you know, we, we've been anal- we got the analysis on point. Zach in the back jumped in several times and helped us out. So pretty good. I think, um, remember subscribe to Auburn live. One dollar for one month. Come get a trial run with us. You will not be disappointed. You'll want to stick around, I promise. Um, for Alan Head, for Zach in the back, and for Jeffrey Lee, who should be landing sometime tomorrow, uh, or as you're watching this, um, stay out of that left lane. See ya.